This is going to be, I think I'll get, be able to get you back on time a little bit because uh, some of the stuff that Kurt talked about, which is really cool, is, is in my presentation as well. And, and it's neat because you guys are, actually look like you're getting more response than we are. So that, that's very, very cool stuff. So managing for high yields, let's, let's take the next step now and see if we can take that crop that we've got in the ground as uniform as we can and figure out what we do next. Of course, if you're going to manage for high yields, you really need to, to know who you're going to listen to and who you're not going to listen to, right? And so this, this little slide here describes life. And in life, there are people like the rabbit on the uh, right. Uh, they are all show and no go. And of course, who would that be like in, in this world? Well, I really think that's probably Martin. Martin, <laughs> congratulations, you are the man with, you know, all show, no go. <laughs> anyway, then you get other people that are all go and no show, right, with the big root. And who would that be? Well, that's got to be me. Come on. Absolutely, that's got to be me. <laughs> all right. So just, I, I'm going to start a wee bit on rotation. And uh, Christy talked a little bit about it. Kurt talked a little bit about it. I'm not going to spend long here. But it really is intriguing to me how much impact wheat has on the rotation. And so just a little bit of data from Ontario, Dave Hooker's work and also Bill Dean's work as well. Uh, Amelie Gaudin has gone back all the, over this research. And so notice as soon as I put wheat in the rotation, what, whether regardless of tillage system, what happens with my corn yield? And so across our data set, if you put everything together, uh, you plant wheat in the rotation with or without clover, you get somewhere between a 2 and 8% yield increase on corn. And so that really, when you do the math on whether or not you grow wheat, you put wheat in the rotation and you get 200 bushel corn, the first 10 bushels of corn, that profit should go to the wheat crop. Now you beggars will be just like the farmers in Ontario, and there's no way you'll do that. You'll say, 200 bushel corn, I'm gonna grow corn, baby. But it really should go to the wheat crop. And what's intriguing about this data is that it's not only corn, but if I look at soybeans as well, and that's not showing up worth a dog on, I don't know what happened there, but if I look at soybeans, I get a soybean yield boost as well. And that's two years after the fact. And in our data set, the soybean yield boost is actually bigger than the corn yield boost, which is quite bizarre, but we get a 10 to 14% yield increase to growing wheat in the rotation two years later on soybeans. So now not only do I have 10 bushels of corn that really I should give the credit to the, to the wheat crop, but if I have 50 bushel soybeans, there's five bushels, those first five bushels of soybeans that profit goes to the wheat crop as well. And that's really kind of an intriguing outcome. Uh, and that just shows you that, uh, that there's a difference between no-till and conventional. We'll carry on. Just a, a kind of cool thing as well is notice what happens in terms of the nitrogen requirement that I need once I put wheat or wheat underseeded to red clover in the rotation. By the way, how many guys in the room underseed wheat with red clover? Put up your hand. What's wrong with the rest of you? No, I'm serious. What's wrong with the rest of you? Oh yeah, you kept burning it off with the herbicide. Christy's going to solve that for you. Spray it. Anyway, we'll talk about that. Okay, because real, realistically, I, you, can, you can have we have had 120 bushel wheat with a perfect stand of clover, clover underneath. So keep trying because the, the benefits are big. Look at the difference in terms of the, the nitrogen response and then look at the difference in the, in the amount of nitrogen you have to apply to the corn crop to maximize yield. And so now not only do I have 10 bushels more corn, 5 bushels more soybeans, but now I can cut my nitrogen rate by about 70 pounds. And that less nitrogen that I need on the corn crop, that goes to the wheat crop as well. So all of a sudden, this wheat crop is probably the most crop profitable crop you have in the rotation. 
and you guys all think it's just a rotation crop and you could get a real rat's ass about it and you don't manage it to save your soul and it's making you more money than anything else. Anyway, yes, sir. So that's an excellent question. The question is, is this rotation benefit if I harvest the straw or if I don't harvest the straw? And what's most intriguing is at the Alora site, we harvest the straw. At the Ridgetown site, we do not harvest the straw. It doesn't matter. Now, long-term organic matter, it will matter. But short-term rotation benefits doesn't matter. Have a nice day. In fact, in the Alora data, in the Alora data where they take the straw off, if you compare a corn-soybean rotation to a corn-soybean-wheat rotation with straw removed, your soil quality parameters, once you put the wheat in the rotation, are far greater than continuous corn or corn-soybean by themselves. The root system, it's the roots that count, right? And wheat has this wonderful, fine, fibrous root system, and it it improves water aggregate stability, it, it gives you better water holding capacity, higher organic matter levels. You keep wheat in the rotation with or without the straw, you're actually better for organic matter even than the corn soybean rotation. So if you want to sell the straw, I'm pretty much over that. Eh? I used to tell growers don't sell the straw because you're giving away organic matter. I'm past that. If you need to sell straw to make wheat profitable, keep it in your rotation, sell the stinking straw, keep growing wheat. Now, of course, I am a wheat guy, so I might have a little bit of bias there. But anyway. Okay. Oops, sorry. That's... So we're about here. Okay. Oh, yeah. A bit of fun. You've got to keep you awake. So just before I go on, I, I almost forgot, but Jody, I will remember. Uh, a grower did ask if I could address quickly about planting date and both Hessian fly and barley yellow dwarf virus, right? So everybody talks about the Hessian fly free date and don't plant before the Hessian fly, or the fly free date. How many guys in the room have ever seen a problem with Hessian fly? Put up your hand. Always late. No. <laughs> okay, I see a couple guys with really gray hair. So I, I've done this job for 30 years. In 30 years, I have seen a Hessian fly problem exactly zero times. So could you plant too early? The answer is absolutely yes. What I will tell you is that the yield penalty from planting late is far greater than the yield penalty from planting early. And I don't know if it's our new varieties have better Hessian fly tolerance and better yellow bar barley yellow dwarf virus tolerance because those are the two diseases that we really get into trouble with. But if you think back to some of the slides I showed, I mean, I made the ultimate extension error when I was about three years in. Niagara area for us is really, really tough clay. And if, it, if you get into one inch rain there, you can be out of the field for three weeks. Like it's just ugly. Their optimum planting date should be October the 5th. Okay, that's the, the right time for them to plant wheat. I had a grower call me once on September the 10th, said, Peter, I didn't get my soybeans planted this spring, it was too wet, summer followed the ground all year, uh, by golly, perfect for wheat right now, is it too early to plant wheat? September the 10th? No way you should plant wheat, you gotta wait. September the 13th it rained. <laughs> on October the 10th, or pardon me, November the 10th rather, on November the 10th he called me up and said, Peter, is it too late to plant wheat? <laughs> The yield penalty from planting too early is far less than the yield penalty from planting too late. So if you're on a gorgeous soil like most of you probably have, a silt loam, a sandy loam, you know you can plant in the perfect window, then don't plant early. But I don't care about barley yellow dwarf and I don't care about hessian fly. Until they become an issue, I, I just ignore them, period. Have a nice day. So the comment is, if I planted that early, I'm going to have huge growth, right? And you are absolutely right, sir, if you are still growing Frederick or Augusta. But the new wheats we have are low-growing prostate wheats. We don't grow them like they do in Texas to graze the stinking things. We grow them for grain. We, we have a real crop. 
And so they, what happens if you plant really early is that you get just low growth, but it's thick like a lawn. And then if you plant, and, and you know, Kurt, when you do your trials, you really got to cut your seeding rate on those early seeded trials because I think that'll help with your lodging. You can keep your nitrogen rates up. You can go like skank. But you plant super early, you got to go way low on seeding rates or that lawn gets full of disease and it does reduce yield. So you're right, there are some implications there, okay? Okay, I'm going to carry on here, so we'll carry on. So a few things, oh, that picture doesn't show up very well. I uh, hope it does better on the other screens. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? Wheel tracks? Corn rows, absolutely. So that is corn row uh, syndrome in wheat. So two years, or three, uh, let me think, two years previous, because it's corn soybean wheat rotation, right? We have a two by two band of phosphorus that we put on with the corn planter. Now, if you guys don't use starter, uh, starter on your corn, then you will never see this. You're also not maximizing your corn yield, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother discussion and I'm not here to do that today. So get with the program, use starter on your corn, but this just shows you how responsive wheat is to phosphorus. And so if you're not using a starter fertilizer on your wheat crop, you are not a real wheat farmer, get over it. I'm dead serious, you laugh, I'm dead serious. Here's what it looks like. So this is a soil test of 35. Now it doesn't always look this dramatic, I admit, I'm, I'm picking slides that, that show the point. This is a sandy loam soil with a soil test of 35 parts per million. So for, that, uh, for you guys, that would be like a soil test of 70 because you talk pounds per acre. Uh, it's, it's way out of the range. We should not need phosphorus whatsoever. Wheat, because it develops in the fall when it's cool and it has a high phosphorus demand, needs starter phosphorus. And that is pretty much regardless of soil test. I'll show you that in a minute. Anyway, that's what that field looked like at harvest. Which crop would you rather have? Oh shoot, I've got tons per hectare there. Anyway, uh, that, is, uh, that is somewhere in the range of a 38 bushel per acre yield increase. Now, it's not always that good, but it heads more uniform, it has better winter survival. You, you simply have to use starter phosphorus. Here's a, just a, you know, all my trials put together. Shane and I do a bunch of work on this all the time. We're looking at starter fertilizer. You can clearly see that the top treatments are essentially 100 pounds of MAP. All of those treatments have 100 pounds of MAP in them, while 100 pounds of MEZ is essentially the same thing. By the way, you'll notice MEZ is no better than MAP. So we don't think MEZ is worth the extra money on, on wheat, but that's just our opinion. And if you really look at that, it's a strict phosphorus response. So you can see the more phosphorus I put on, the more response I get, except with the broadcast, I put on a whole lot of phosphorus. I still get response. Com oh shoot, I'm using the stinking pointer again. Sorry, if you look to the very right hand side of the screen is my broadcast treatment. And it, that 200 pounds of broadcast is about the equivalent of the 40 pounds seed placed. So I essentially need five times as much fertilizer broadcast to get the same response. So broadcast phosphorus can work on a wheat crop, but seed placed is way better. And by the way, if you know anything at all about al algal blooms in the Great Lakes, if, you were, if I was in Ohio near Toledo, they'd think this was a big, big deal. Uh, if I was on Pelee Island, which is part of Ontario, out in Lake, Lake Erie, uh, there was a, about a two-week period they could not, not only could they not drink their water, they could not shower in their water because of the algae bloom and the microcystosis that was in the water. It, it, it's nasty. So broadcast fertilizer from an environmental standpoint is bad, bad, bad. Seed placed is good. Seed placed gives you yield. And this is just to show, uh, if, you, if you sort of look at the blue bars on the right-hand side, that's low soil test phosphorus, so you can see huge yield responses, which we already talked about. What really surprised us in this database when Ken went back and redid it for us was that even at very high soil test levels, so up to a fifth, well, basically up to a 60, so 120 pounds per acre of phosphorus available, we are still picking up about four bushels per acre in yield. So regardless of soil test, it's just all about phosphorus. 
If you think you need some potash in that blend, uh, you don't really need potash in that blend. It's funny because corn needs potash, wheat does not. And it's just the, the 150 pound treatment of 73420 is 100 pounds of map plus 50 pounds of potash compared to 100 pounds of map by itself. And guess what? They yield exactly the same. So it's pretty simple. It's called phosphorus, phosphorus, phosphorus. So we're about here. And we'll carry on. Let's talk about nitrogen. This is one of the things that I really find intriguing about this whole wheat game is that everybody's always looking for the magic bullet, right? And I see Kurt's going to work on silicon. Did I see that right? And boron and, oh man. If, if you can get the basics right, you're, you're just going to have high yields. And everybody looks for this, this magic bullet. Man, they rarely exist. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is, 1034O in with your 28% when you're putting it on the soil surface in the spring. Yeah, really intriguing. A uh, little bit of work that we did on corn. If you mix 1034O with 28%, uh, you get a negative reaction. You get less yield. So I, I, now I haven't done that on wheat, but I would say uh, no. And I would also say that remember that, that the starter effect we're getting is primarily in the fall. And so if I wait till the spring, and I, now I'm broadcasting it, right, because I'm putting it on the surface, the chances of response are incredibly small. So I'm going to say no. I, I, think, I think it costs too much for that phosphorus for the response you'll get. Any other questions on starter? Yes, sir. Uh, getting the starter on the phosphate in the fall, I assume you're putting it through the drill then? The Absolutely, through the drill, yes. And, and so I love air carts. A twin tank air cart is the ultimate fertilizer delivery system because you can blow phosphorus down out of one, one tank and seed down out of the other tank. And if you have a single box drill and you're telling me you can't do starter fertilizer because you have a single box drill, you are wrong. You simply take your, I mean, take your wheat seed to the elevator that, or the fertilizer dealer or figure out how to do it. We have many ingenious farmers. They blend the wheat with the fertilizer and put it all through the same box. And it works. It works perfect. And how do you calibrate it? It's quite simple. So if, now I gotta go back to pounds per acre because the stinking drill isn't calibrated in seeds per acre. So anyway, if, if you figure out that you're gonna put on 150 pounds of seed per acre, if that's the number, just to use a number, you need to put 50 pounds per acre of MAP. That's the base rate of, of MAP, 11.520 that you want with the wheat seed. So that adds together to 200 pounds. The drill setting, your cup setting, right, on your, on your cups on your drill, you probably all have them at, at setting one because that's the wheat setting. Not with fertilizer, it's not. You go to setting two because the fertilizer's a little more abrasive. You leave them at set at one, you're going to be in trouble. So you've got to go to cup setting two. And then you take your, your 150 plus 50 equals 200. You look at your chart and where it says 180. So you basically take 10% off that and that's where you start. And that'll get you in the game. I mean, it's, uh, calibrating a drill is a, I don't know, it's a bit like trying to count a herd of sheep as they run past or something. <laughs> anyway, it is a bit of a challenge, but that will get you in the game. Yes, sir? What about foliar feeding uh, once the wheat's up? Foliar feeding once the wheat's up. Uh, so foliar feeding works, works very well for micronutrients because you need a very small amount. Phosphorus is a macronutrient. If you think for one second that you can foliar feed phosphorus, nitrogen, or potash and get enough into the plant to make a difference, you are dreaming. You Period. Know, two gallons on in pearl, I'm talking about the fall. Yep. Two so two. In furrow, I mean, can't you... But two gallons in furrow, and I get 50% uptake. Two gallons foliar, and I get 5% uptake. Plus, the wheat crop already had to grow to the three leaf stage. And I want it there immediately for the big boost. The answer is no, I'm out of that game. I, I, think, I don't think it'll work. There's another hand. Yes, sir. Regarding blending the fertilizer with the seed, does that affect the seed? If you need to get it planted that day or that hour? Yeah, so the question is, I'm going to blend fertilizer with the seed. This, this idiot from Ontario said it works. I'm going to try it. 
Does it affect the seed? And the answer is, if you have it in an open wagon and it rains, it will affect the seed. <laughs> but if you keep it dry, we have had people who blended it together in the V-box, then it rained, they didn't get it planted that fall, they kept it till the next year, and it was fine. So you got to keep it dry, <laughs> right? Like this, and, and remember, Fertilizer draws more water than seeds, so it, it's, it's a challenge. You can't leave it outside with the tarp on it and, and expect it to stay dry. It won't. I mean, it will for one rainstorm, but it, all winter it won't. But the answer is it works fine. So you could, if it takes you a week to plant your wheat, that's how it works. If it takes you a week to plant your wheat, it's not an issue. Absolutely not. The big, the big cha challenge for a lot of guys is I don't want any left over, right? So they never, and, and so a lot of our guys now will take a V-box that has, is split, right? It has a divider in the middle, seed in one side, fertilizer in the other. Just figure out how wide open to put the... the draw. It takes a little bit of calibration. I'm not arguing with that, but they've figured it out. It actually works, sir. Will that seed, would the fertilizer be hot? Will it burn the seed? Would that seed, yeah, so, so an excellent question. What about the fertilizer burning the seed? And yes, sir, if you went to 300 pounds per acre of map with the seed, you would burn the seed. Eventually, you get too high. The rates I'm talking about do not burn the seed at all. 100 pounds a map, 50 pounds a map, somewhere in that range, no issue. OK. Anything else? Ah. What about 1034-0? Nothing wrong with 1034-0 in furrow. A 624-6, I don't care. It's a, a, a pound of P, phosphorus, a pound of P is a pound of P no matter how you pee it. Okay, so 1034O is fine. The problem with 1034O is that you can't get enough on. Um, my guys that run 1034O that are determined liquid guys run nine gallons per acre. It gets pretty pricey. If you price it out, liquid fertilizer is generally twice to two and a half times more expensive per pound of phosphorus. And, and that's what really challenges us. Yes, there was another hand over somewhere over here. No? Okay, anything else? We'll carry on. Yes, way back. Phil. I'm not doing any potash at all in the fall. My, yeah, I'll show you later on that, that I put my potash on in the spring. Our data says it doesn't need it. And we, I mean, this is one of the biggest data sets I have, so I'm pretty confident I don't need potash in the fall. OK, uh, we need to eat lunch, so we're going to carry on. You can, you can nail me at lunch. You can nail me at the, I, I, some reason I speak three times today, a bit scary. but. Uh, we did these SMART trials. Uh, if people have heard me give this presentation before. This will be review. I apologize for that, that. But this is, I mean, it's not new news, but it also hasn't changed. And I have nothing uh, newer to tell you from a nitrogen standpoint. And this still works. So this is our trial. Uh, we won't get into that. Here's all the people that, that I need to thank uh, for it. And so certainly I, I noticed that uh, Christy and Kurt both uh, uh, and, the, and the UAV speaker all made sure they thanked their, their sponsors. I need to thank our sponsors because you can't do this stuff without money. So you're paying a check off here. That's a good thing. It really is a good thing because none of this research happens without money, right? So keep supporting the organization. Our trials look something like this. Essentially, we're looking at nitrogen. And for some reason, that didn't come up. But uh, we did them all field scale, though. That is one of the things that we are very... Um, stuck on is that if you can't do it like a farmer, then don't do it. Uh, we have a bunch of researchers who want to go out and spread, do nitrogen trials by spreading urea by hand. You know, to try to get the perfect uniform spread, spreading urea by hand in a, a block that's, uh, I don't know, three feet wide by 10 feet long, you can do it, but it's pretty challenging. We want to make sure it works on your farm. So we do all our trials uh, with field scale equipment. We, the plastic dividers are set there to make sure we don't get drift between treatments. And so the treatments are 10 feet wide, and we drive through the field at 8 mile an hour or something like that. right? So it, it's field scale stuff. Uh, of course, every once in a while, you run into a little bit of trouble. <laughs> and that's what it looks like from an aerial view. So we're looking at nitrogen and fungicides. That is the focus of this trial. And you can see there's three different varieties there. So we're, we're looking at it across varieties. Varieties do make a difference. And you can pretty much pick out some of the trials. The dark trials did not have a fungicide applied. 
the light trials did, and I'm talking within the variety, right? So the variety runs longitudinally uh, from the bottom left corner going up, the varieties run, and the treatments obviously run the same way as the sprayer, right? So there's differences. The other thing that we did within this though, and, and I challenge you all to do this on your own farm now, because it's quite simple on your own farm now that you have auto steer, it's, you, everybody can be a researcher. And by the way, if you will be researchers and you will take what Kurt's doing or Martin's doing and say, okay, so those crazy researchers, they, they have 20 different treatments and there's no way in the world I'm gonna do 20 different treatments. But you know, out of those, those three, they might make sense. Well, with auto steer, you can do those three replicated in your field and then you can support their research with on-farm field scale data and that becomes an incredibly powerful information source. And if we could harness that, we could move things forward so much faster. It's really cool. So we did that with this project. We did those three treatments out in farmer's fields and it's just the sprayer tracks, right? And you drive that track twice, one half the booms on for the first half with a treatment, the other half's on the next time. And, and that way you can randomize and replicate and it doesn't take a whole lot of space or a whole lot of time works cool. So what did we find out? So we're looking at, uh, by the way, you know, you know what a T1, a T2, a T3 is? Yes, no? You familiar with that nomenclature? No. So T1 is herbicide timing. So I put the fungicide on with my herbicide. T2 is flag leaf timing. And T3 is my head scab timing. All right? So, what we looked at, you know, across the three years, different nitrogen rates, 90 pounds of nitrogen to 150 pounds of nitrogen. And if you look across the no fungicide trials, because that's the way we used to do research, that's pretty boring. I get four bushels to go from 90 to 120 pounds of nitrogen. I get three bushels maybe to go to 150. Yeah, the yields are going up, but it's not exciting and it's not putting dollars in my pocket. Similarly, if I look at my fungicides, you know, the fungicide story has been the same for my entire career. You use a T3 fungicide, you get 8 to 10% in yield, and that's exactly what it says. That's the most boring data set I ever came across in my life. Like, why do we bother doing this again? But then you start looking at the interaction, and that's when it gets interesting. So what you need to look at is not across and up and down, but look on the diagonal. And now when I increase nitrogen and I add the fungicide, suddenly I picked up 12 bushels per acre. And when I go to 150, I'm not at 12 bushels per acre, I'm at 18 bushels per acre. Are you interested in 18 bushels per acre more yield? And if you're not, I, I suggest you leave the meeting now because it's really not much point. <laughs> like, yeah. And so what it is, is this nitrogen fungicide synergy where one plus one doesn't equal two, one plus one equals 2.3 or 2.5. There's a reaction together that makes them work better. It actually makes perfect sense. If you go back to that first stuff I talked about, the fungicide is simply keeping the plant healthy enough that it can utilize the added nitrogen. And if you put the added nitrogen on without the fungicide, you just fill the crop with disease and there's no leaf tissue left and it can't use the extra nitrogen. So when you really go back and think about it, it's not rocket science, it's just that it took me 27 years or 25 years to get to the point where I understood enough to actually do it. So this is very cool. So then you say, okay, so that's across varieties. Is there a difference in varieties? This is our best variety. R47, I expect you recognize that variety. We don't grow it much anymore, but if you're a soft red guy, this was the, the variety for a lot of years. 37 bushel per acre yield increase. Unbelievable. But that's what the data said. If you look at the poorest variety, so Emmett was our least responsive variety. I don't, you guys don't grow it here. It's not regionally adapted for you. It works okay in Ontario, particularly in the northern climates. And we got 14 bushels. 14 bushels is, is a little bit over break-even. Break-even was 12. So what it says is there is a variety impact. And by the way, if you don't have the right varieties, this doesn't work. 
So you got to try it on your own farm, on your own variety to make sure it works. But boy, when it works, who wouldn't want 30 bushel per acre more yield? That's amazing. So what happened on the field trials? Because we did a bunch of field trials. That was the small plot stuff. So in 2008, we did it the first time. And when we added the fungicide plus the nitrogen, we got 21 bushel per acre average yield over 20 locations. And Johnson is the guy doing this, and he says, that's a lie, right? There's no way it is that good. It's got to be a year influence. 2008, huge yields for us. It's a year influence. So we did it again in 2009, 16 locations. We got 21 bushels per acre. And I'm just shaking my head, and we're going to do it again in 2010. And one of my best cooperators calls me up and says, Peter, I won't work with you again this year. He said, well, that's not quite true. I'll do any other plot you want, but I will not do this trial. And I said, Don, like, what the heck? We need, what, why not? He said, I have this problem. <laughs> So we got to move on. 2010, another 16 sites, 18 bushels per acre. This, this stuff, it works. It absolutely works. So huge, you're going to increase nitrogen rates, you've got to have fungicides. And so now, Shane and I are, are sort of looking at what happens on the same location when we do it with and without fungicides. And what's really intriguing, and I hope you can see that, the top line is with fungicides. The bottom line is without fungicides, you can clearly show, see that the slope of the line changes. Yes, sir? Are you sort of playing, split, applying nitrogen or are you putting all on at once? What's, uh... Excellent question. Are we split applying the nitrogen or are we putting it all on at once? The answer is we're putting it all on at once. Hmm. Now, Even at this is, so, so these trials, essentially what we did was whatever the grower did, that's what we did. Because he put the nitrogen on for us, right? And so if he put it all on on the 20th of April, it all went on on the 20th of April. There's a few data, data points in, in that data set, the 50-some data sites, where, where the grower normally split applied as nitrogen. So there are a few in there where they split applied. But by far the majority was all one shot somewhere around the 20th of April most of the time. And you're all looking at me saying, yeah, it's going flat as, as pee on a plate. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. We have been astounded how little lodging we got out of these trials. The very first year we did it, we went to 150. I gave everybody a growth regulator because I was so afraid it would lodge. Some of the guys didn't put it, get it put on. It all stood up. And we've learned that you can go to 150 pounds of nitrogen with most, most of our varieties now, and they stand. So again, if you're a 90 pound nitrogen guy, for goodness sakes, do not go to 150 pounds of nitrogen and say, Johnson said it'll work, so I'm doing the whole thousand acres, like she could be ugly, but, but step it up, go, go in stepwise increments. I would suggest if you're at 90 pounds right now, go do some strips at 120. Make sure you use the fungicide, see what happens. If, if you get more yield and it stands, go to 150. We're now going to 180, because we want to make it lodge, yes? What was the stage growth of the wheat? So what was the growth stage of the wheat uh, when, we, when we applied that? Just beginning stem elongation most of the time. So I don't know, what's that in Feeks, Martin? The beginning of stem elongation. Yeah, so on, on, for us, on those sites, on April 20th, it was like the growing point was above ground on May the 1st. And that's why we targeted April 20th, because... Yeah, four or five, okay. See, I don't understand this Feeks stage. We, we use the right... Uh, staging system, it's called Zadix. It makes some sense. Your feet stage makes no. Anyway, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> so we, by, but you know, as far as yes, sir. I feel like there might be some sort of confusion. So you're putting the nitrogen on around April 20th, and then you're coming back and applying the fungicide at something around week six, which is then along the next case. No, okay. So let me let me back up. Um, well, no, okay. Let me just, now we're stuck. Okay. Uh, we put the nitrogen on whenever the grower put the nitrogen on, period. The fungicide, if I, if I uh, in many of these trials, right, I will back up, sorry, I will back up. Well, maybe I'll back up. Yes. 
So the fungicide in many of these trials was only a head scab fungicide. There was no fungicide put on with, some of them did put on a fungicide with the weed control, but the only critical fungicide I, I said must be involved in this program was the head scab fungicide. So all the nitrogen at FEEX 5, April 20th, 25th time frame, no fungicide till June 10th at head, at head scab timing or whenever that happened to be. And that's, that's the key criteria of making this work. And if you want to use more than one fungicide, we'll get to that. That is, that is coming. But those are the key criteria. Other questions? Put your nitrogen on that late, it ain't going to help, is it? Your head, isn't your favorite fungicide? Just... No, the nitrogen goes on at FEEX 4 5. The fungicide goes on at heading. Okay? FEEX 10.1, 10. 10. yes. That, that one I know because it's critical, but. Okay, so, so you're absolutely right. If you waited to put all your nitrogen on that late, you would give up a lot of yield. No, no, this is, sorry, I'm, I don't mean to make this confusing or complicated, because I work with farmers, and if you make it complicated, they just don't do it. And by the way, I farm in my spare time, and if it's complicated, I don't do it either. Like, good grief. So it's not complicated. Whenever you put your nitrogen on, whenever that is normally goes on, just go with more nitrogen. No, 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 do not, never, ever put your fungicide in with your nitrogen. That's called a disaster. Like, just don't do it. So they are two separate applications. The synergy, the synergy is that you have enough nitrogen to make the plant go and the fungicide to keep it green basically through grain fill. Remember I talked, it's all about grain fill? My T3 fungicide, my scab timing fungicide is at the beginning of the grain fill, right at, at pollination. So it's keeping that plant healthy through the grain fill period, right? Okay, so are we clear? Because I, I apologize about that. Yes, sir. Are your numbers up there, are you using starter fertilizer on them? So are my numbers up there, do those, do those crops have starter fertilizer? And so surprisingly enough, most of the people who work with me, the guys that will work with me, sort of believe what I say so yes, 95% uh, of those fields would have had starter fertilizer applied. Yes. So then you're actually putting on a nitrogen. Oh yeah, but 10 pounds of nitrogen in the fall through with 100 pounds of MAP or 5 pounds with 50 pounds of MAP, that doesn't count. It's just so little it doesn't count. Half of it's gone by spring, you ignore it. All right? Okay, we, we're, it's lunchtime. So I'll just finish up quickly. So it, you know, it is this... Uh, Synergy, I've talked about that. Fungicide timing, so this is the, this I think we need to stop at briefly. The later you put the fungicide on, the more yield kick you get. And so I have lots of guys, you know, ask me, can I do this, this synergy thing and put the fungicide in my, with my herbicide? And the answer is no, because you got to keep the plant green through grain fill. The later you put the fungicide on, the more yield you get. And that's clearly just showing it. So if you notice, the T3, which is the scab timing, the T3 gives me as much yield increase with one application as two applications it, when I do the weed control timing, the T1, plus the flag leaf timing, T2. Right? So one application late in the going gives you the most yield. If you want more yield, then you do the, the flag leaf plus the head scab spray, or I would even maybe back it up to a T1.5, but you know, it, it's just, it's really about keeping the crop clean. Yes? Are, if it's about keeping the crop clean, are you concerned about color removal with the, the, the middle of the application out? So am I concerned about powdery mildew with leaving the middle application out? No. Two reasons. Number one, powdery mildew is not very yield impacting. It's pretty rare that powdery mildew impacts yield. Now, you, so, so stock strength it can, but if, so if you think about powdery mildew, right, and the whole leaf looks white, and if you take your thumb and you clean the mildew off the leaf, what color is the leaf tissue underneath? It's green, more or less. There's some yellow. It's not, I mean, I, I'm, I'm stretching it a little. So the other thing is that if it goes over 28 degrees, mildew stops. And we mostly get a hot day late May, 
where it goes over 28 degrees and the mildew pretty much stops and a rain comes and washes the mildew off and it's very rare to have mildew impacting the crop later in the going. As far as stock strength with mildew, yeah, it's a very minor impact. Unless, I don't know your varieties, maybe you have some really mildew susceptible varieties and if you do, then the earlier application might be more warranted, but it's not a disease I worry about very much. It's the least uh, the disease that impacts the wheat crop the least. Absolutely. All right. Okay. All right, I'll finish up because it is time. We're about here. <laughs> Yeehaw. And I'm going to skip split N because I think Kurt talked about split N and my message is essentially the same uh, other than we really have trouble with split N. Uh, if you go too late and you burn the crop, you lose yield and the rainfall's got to be at the right time. And at the end of the day uh, with split nitrogen, I'll just stop here quickly. Uh, it, what it does really to me, split nitrogen weatherproofs the crop. The challenge with split nitrogen for you guys is that I want you to go out with the second application on the 15th of May because you have nothing else to do on the 15th of May. <laughs> and you all look at me and say, you are off your stinking rocker. I mean, we, we'll grow wheat, but it isn't that important. We're planting soybeans and spraying corn and the real crop's got to take over. So I get that. And, and so it's trying to get you to split nitrogen is always going to be a challenge. What it does do is it weatherproofs. If you get a really wet period, you're splitting nitrogen, you're not worried about loss because you're going to come back in with some nitrogen. So it weatherproofs the crop. It gives you better weed control. Believe it or not, you get better weed control with split nitrogen. You get less lodging. You want to improve your lodging? Put 80 pounds on up front and the wheat crop grows like it thinks it's got 80 pounds. Come back on the 15th of May and put another 60 pounds on and it, the wheat crop's still growing like it thinks it has 80 pounds of nitrogen because it developed its stem with less nitrogen. So you don't go tall and spindly and get this wobbly plant. Anyway, a more uniform heading. Yield's a big question mark. We, we're up and down and all over with yield. We cannot consistently improve yield uh, and uh, yeah. And I think, David, uh, that will stop because uh, I'm out of time and we got to eat and uh, we'll talk more after lunch. <laughs>